Good evening, and welcome to Florida on the Line. I'm Margie Menzel. When seven-year-old Gabriel Myers hanged himself in the shower of his foster home in April, he was on powerful psychotropic drugs. And Department of Children and Family Secretary George Sheldon ordered a review to learn whether other children were being medicated without proper oversight. Today, the Miami Herald reported that despite a 2005 state law requiring consent from a guardian or judge, caseworkers failed to get permission to administer psychotropic drugs in 45% of cases in a sample of 112 children younger than age 6. Tonight, we welcome Senator Rhonda Storms, chair of the Senate Children, Families, and Elder Affairs Committee. Senator Storms, we are delighted that you could join us from your district, uh, from your home in in Brandon. And um, we know that you have been very concerned about this issue for some time, and I'm wondering if you could tell us about why. Well, first of all, I don't accept that the only way to treat a child is uh, is to medicate, uh, particularly children five and under, yeah, but I would go so far as to say uh, ten and under, that uh, that the only way to treat those children is psychotropically with with drugs. I, I think uh, we've moved in our society uh, to uh, because of the the pace of our society, the demand for conveniences, and and the de- demand for more personal time. We've We've moved to the default uh, form of treatment for children to be medication. And I, I think that that's problematic in healthy children, and it's particularly problematic in, uh, in our younger children uh, in those children who are, who are troubled already. And so I, I do think that we have um, moved to become, instead of treating the underlying issues, we say, well, we can't deal with their behavior, so let's just medicate them so that they'll be little zombies. Well, you know, there's trouble with that, not just as the knee-jerk reaction that people might have to that and say that's just not acceptable. But in addition to that, what, what drugging children does is it, it, flatlines, it flatlines them, not in the medical sense but in the emotional sense. So you have a child who... Certainly you dull the pain that they have, but the other thing that you do is you dull the joy and, and you remove from the child the ability to be childlike, to do the fun things that, that the child uh, may be able to do. And um, those would be natural mitigators to the pain, to the psychological trauma that the, that the child has, has suffered. So I think that that's a, that's a huge problem for these little bitty babies, but, but not just that. We can do better. We can reach these children, and we can, we can minister to them. We can comfort them. We can treat their broken hearts and their, bind up their wounds, and we can do that uh, in a better way than just drugging them and getting them through to adulthood than taking their drugs away or, it, God forbid, that they begin to self-medicate and then say, okay, now you're f- free. Our responsibility is done with you. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to parent these children and to come alongside them and to help them and to restore them the best that we can uh, to health and to mental health. And I don't believe that uh, that can be done if our default response is psychotropic drugs. That's just a thumbnail sketch of what my concerns are. But, uh, but that's, that's the, my underlying philosophy and attitude toward treating children with psychotropic drugs. And very succinct. All right, let's go to Chris with a question for Senator yes, Storms. Hi. hi. Thank, you. Thank you for taking my call. I have a question for Senator Storm. Do you have any ideas what the legislature can do to hold those accountable at DCF and other parties who have drugged foster kids without consent? Thank you for the, uh, for the question. Uh, absolutely. Um, first of all, there needs to be penalties. In, our, uh, in this instance, it's clear that the, there's legislative requirement uh, to have obtained consent and to follow uh, particular procedures. Those procedures were not followed. In my opinion, there needs to be stronger penalties uh, for those, both departmentally and for the, uh, for the CBCs who, who failed. Everyone who failed along the way should be penalized. And in my experience, uh, you know, I mean, it's easy to say, okay, what we're going to do is fire the caseworker 
who failed to do it. Um, and then everybody goes on, we dust off our hands, and we say, okay, we've taken care of it. But that is not uh, the only answer. And, and in most cases, that's a scapegoat response. Uh, there needs to be penalties from the executive director of the CBCs all the way down the line, and also from the department. Those people who knew that they should have been, re they should have been uh, following up with this should be held accountable for that. But then more importantly, we need to deal with the issue, and we need to adopt policies on the use of psychotropic drugs for children five and under particularly, but, but across the board. I absolutely agree that we should not be drugging these children and using this as a default mechanism, that, that we're going to uh, use these as a chemical restraint. It does not treat the underlying psychological trauma. I have two children, and um, a 10-year-old little girl and a 9-month-old little boy, and children development who are developmentally normal who have not had any psychological trauma are going to have, they're going to get tired, they're going to get cranky, they're going to get hungry, they're going to have colds, they're just going to have bad days, and they're going to misbehave on those bad days. Now, you couple that with a child who's had a major psychological trauma, a child who's been maybe raped or beaten or burned or some had some horrible trauma, those children are going to have behavioral problems that are magnified, and that is what needs to be addressed, and that can be addressed through intensive therapy, but will not be addressed if you just drug the child and then say, okay, good, at least we've calmed them down and they can sit in a room and sit there quietly so we don't have to deal with it, and they're not bothering me as an adult. So, uh, so then they'll, we'll get them through until they get to be 18. That's a crime, and it's an additional, and it's a moral failure. It's an additional trauma to that child because we have failed to equip that child to deal with his with the trauma that's happened to him and so that's the other issue that we absolutely must get to we have to adopt strong policies against the use of psychotropic drugs as the primary force of treatment for these children and instead move toward a therapy uh, strategy clearly we are looking at a systemic issue well let me ask this is there, is there... Can I just say one more thing? Please. Uh, one more thing that I think that we have not addressed, that, that I think we sort of touched on, and that is the problem uh, with, with, the, uh, with the behavior of some of these psychiatrists who are, uh, who are prescribing, uh, prescribing these drugs despite, and not following through with their own uh, medical protocols. I mean, I sent a letter in this particular case, in Gabriel's case, uh, to, to ACA and to the Florida Board of Medicine to please examine the cases. When, when you have one of the things that Jim Sewell's work group talked about on Monday, according to my staff's briefing to me, was the, uh, the issue of, not, of, of, of having these uh, physicians engage in what's called red flag behavior. In other words, if they're, uh, if they're um, prescribing these drugs to children, then what happens is uh, ACA analyzes the Medicaid data, as I understand it, and then they contact that physician say, okay, we notice, or they'll send a letter, we notice that you're engaging in this kind of behavior. And that, too, although the agency doesn't call it necessarily problematic, it's undesirable on the, on, on the part of the physician, on the part of the psychiatrist who's doing it. So then ACA contacts them and says, you know, okay, let me give you this information. If the physician still engages in the behavior, then with every level there's additional ramping up. What happens to these doctors? Well, if a letter of counsel is sent to that physician, nobody even knows it. It's private. We don't know that this physician has been told, knock it off, you know, stop doing that. It's just a private letter of counsel, and then that's it. So that physician can still be prescribing medication to our children in the system, even though he's been counseled on that bad behavior he can still or she can still be engaging in that behavior, and that is unacceptable. We should not have physicians who are doing, uh, who are in repeatedly engaging in that behavior, treating our children. Senator Storms, we are just about out of time, and I want to make sure that uh, you get a chance to uh, uh, wrap up your thoughts here. The problem is so great, and, um, and I hope that, that we'll take some of the uh, information that we all are sharing and the passion. And, and I know some of these soldiers that have been in this battle a lot longer than I have may get tired and, uh, and, and, and may just feel like, oh, this more of the same. It's more, and we can't do anything else. But please do not grow weary in well-doing. We owe it to every single child that continues to come into this system.